I'm Eleni of Stathiu, and um, I am very happy to be on this, which is my first e-cancer virtual meeting online with, with colleagues that we usually around these days meet in person, usually somewhere in Chicago. Uh, I'm in Houston at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I am very pleased to be talking with my colleagues from across the Atlantic, Heather Payne from the UK. These are people you don't need to be introduced to. I think you, you all know them. Um, Alvaro Pinto from Spain and Nicola Motte from France. Um, they're, they're, I think we're all a little stuck not being able to visit with each other, but we've, we've met over the days in different meetings. And one of the things we wanted to discuss actually on this live session is the updates in the EAU guidelines, I'll be very biased and say that they are my preferred uh, guidelines and I'm not trying to get in the good graces of Nicola right now. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, because you know, she's a harsh judge. But um, there were some very, very interesting changes. Stronger points came across. I would urge you all to go ahead and read the guidelines regardless, regardless of your level of expertise in the field because they're so nicely written. They, they give a lot of, of nice points that we can use in our own clinics and amongst our coworkers to discuss. And there's also a very nice summary about those changes. We won't have the time to go over everything. So before this meeting, we, we sat down and actually spoke regarding what would be the most important take home message for each one of us in their clinics. And I think we're all fascinated by the advent of new data uh, with the use of androgen signal inhibitors, which are no longer even that novel. So, so I, would, I would not uh, hesitate by you know, going into further introduction about it, but immediately throw it at Heather um, to actually get her views on what, how does the use of androgen signal inhibitors tie in with the guidelines as they are presented and with the actual everyday practice. So Heather. Thank you very much, Eleni. I mean, hormone sensitive prostate cancer, probably one of the most exciting topics around at the moment in, in, in my view. It affects so many men. And you know, five years ago, it's only five years ago that we had the, the charted data which started this explosion of adding in different drugs, new strategies for men diagnosed with hormone sensitive disease. Um, Chartered and Stampede both showing survival benefits for docetaxel. Interestingly, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in the UK, only 27% of men from the National Prostate Cancer Audit up to 2018 were receiving docetaxel for hormone sensitive disease. And whether that was because they were unfit or unwilling is difficult to know. Um, we then moved on to abiraterone again, giving abiraterone and five milligrams of prednisolone with ADT at diagnosis in the latitude and, and stampede style trials, showing this significant overall survival benefit. Now, the charted obviously looked at men with high volume disease, latitude looked at men with high risk prostate cancer. And the Stampede study took all comers. And I think two of the very interesting points have been Stampede have looked back now and have shown that their advantages, irrespective of risk or volume, for both docetaxel and for abiraterone. So I think, you know, this has given us the ability to give these drugs to men with high volume, low volume, high risk, low risk. And perhaps these categories really shouldn't make a lot of difference to our practice, apart from if we're going to give local radiotherapy, where survival benefit for irradiating the prostate alone was only seen for those men with low volume prostate cancer. Now, you know, we had a great choice, docetaxel, abiraterone. And recently, we have seen studies which have been incorporated in the guidelines looking at enzalutamide and apalutamide. The Titan study with apalutamide, Arches and Enzymet with enzalutamide, again showing these significant improvements in overall survival and improvements in quality of life. 
in addition to improvements in, in secondary endpoints, time to pain, um, time to the need for chemotherapy, skeletal related events. And I think one of the interesting things that has come out with quality of life was again from the Stampede data looking at docetaxel versus abiraterone global health quality of life. And that actually showed that with docetaxel, you get this dip in quality of life during treatment, but you never quite caught up to the oral hormonal drugs. And I think maybe as we start to think which of these medications we should use that quality of life is going to be something that is going to play a part. Also, in these terrible times at the moment with COVID, that I think there may be a bigger swing to using the oral chemotherapy drugs. And certainly in the UK, NICE for the first time have um, authorised us to use enzalutamide for hormone sensitive prostate cancer due to the risks for some men with docetaxel. So I think they are fascinating times. I love the guidelines that we've got rid of risk and volume. It's fantastic that we've got apalutamide and, and enzalutamide in there now. And um, I think it's an exciting time. The, I guess the question is, and I don't know Alvaro and Lainey think about this, but if all these drugs are good, should we use them together? Enzimet perhaps saying, we haven't got the data to use both at the present time because there were more side effects and there were no benefits for using chemotherapy and an oral hormone agent. But I guess we watch that space. Yes, before 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 I ask actually Alvaro on his views, uh, Nicola, can you elaborate on that? Because I probably missed that in the reading. I did a power reading as I'm sure we all do. But is it clear there that the combination is not yet recommended? Absolutely. There's a strong evidence. There's a line in the table showing that there's strong message that do not combine systemic treatment together. Even if the outcome of the enzymet is early, with et cetera, et cetera, and that was the main purpose of the trial, there's absolutely no signal to show this. Probably the first one we'll have will come from uh, the PEACE-1 trial, which is a little bit different, but it will be the, the same thing. And what we haven't covered yet is, do we need to combine pelvic prostate radiotherapy plus a combined two systemic drugs? We haven't covered that because we have no data on that. Very simple, but to combine two systemic drugs, strong advice not to do it. Great, so that's very clear. So right now, just, just also to, because you made a point about the radiation of the primary. So what does the guidance say clearly there with regard to oligometastatic disease? Experimental. Experimental. Simple, experimental. Not even weak, not even weak. Experimental, meaning that do it at least either in a prospective trial, the, perfect, the best way to do, or at least in a well-designed, predefined systematic cohort where at the end of the day you have some good answers otherwise we cannot say that's a way to go because the evidence is not there very simple so i don't want to get into a huge argument here but you, we we do know and i didn't say it that heather is not just a medical oncologist she's a radiation oncologist so so Alvaro, sorry, I have to take it back to her because it's a common practice across the board right now. And, and I understand, it's like, we're gonna get to it with the pets and everything. Do you wanna make a rebuttal comment, Heather, on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the data from the radiotherapy arm in, in the Stampede study, you know, did quite clearly show that there was a survival benefit for those men with low volume oligometastasis. Um, and I, I think there is, there's good evidence not to treat people with a polymetastatic, but I think for oligometastasis, radiotherapy just to the prostate, to the primary, and obviously this is going to be in other studies coming, you know, going forward. But I think there's sufficient evidence that I would have, you know, at least given it weak or moderate, I think. If, uh, I think, I think just a minute. Is, yeah. Just a minute. We were discussing, if I understood well, Eleni, we were discussing targeted radiotherapy to the METs, 
not no, no, primary. to the primary, to the primary. To the primary, there's a level one evidence to go for okay. the primary radiotherapy. Okay. So, so, sorry, I, mis I misunderstood. There's a strong back. recommendation at radiotherapy to the prostate is standard of care, as is combination of ADT plus another drug. To the prostate, standard of care for low volume. I misunderstood. Okay. I, I thought we were discussing like, radiotherapy to the max. We like this uncut, unrated kind of approach to life, <laughs> my bad. So, but but going to Alvaro, and, and we didn't pick on one point, uh, which maybe Alvaro wants to point to. Uh, we have this disease that is de novo metastatic, and we have the recurrent disease too. So we didn't have a lot of data from Stampede for, for recurrent disease. We got a little bit of data coming in from Titan and Enzymet. We didn't even have from Latitude. So Alvaro, your thoughts on that and, and as it ties in with, with the whole um, kind of newfound reality in metastatic hormone sensitive disease or hormone naive as I like to call it. And also the big, big question that I think is, is clearly touched upon in the guidelines. How do we monitor these patients who are gonna be exposed to so much more moving forward and thankfully will be living longer? Well, I think that the, 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 there's nothing much more to add than what Heather and Nicola said, but uh, uh, the indirect evidence that we see from the trials are that maybe, maybe these patients are different. The novel metastatic patients and relapsed after radical treatment are different, but we still do not know why, if we have to be sincere. There may be a molecular profile uh, that these two subtypes, there may be just uh, depending on access to diagnostic procedures that patients may be diagnosed earlier and then treated radically and then progress. So I think that most of the evidence, mainly the old evidence, if we may call old something from five years ago, is uh, mostly from uh, the novel patients. And that's where I think that the evidence is more solid. Uh, relapsed patients still ha have a lack of evidence of direct trials designed specifically for these patients. At, at least that's my opinion. So. And, and what, what also has been said that the combination of trials, or, uh, sorry, of drugs uh, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be recommended because we have the ENSAMED uh, results that chemo and ENSA, maybe even deleterious. So the PIS1 and also the Aracens trial with 100% of patients receiving those and then being randomized to darolutamide or placebo will, may give us an answer because the, the trial is homogeneous. But until we have that evidence, we, I think that... Uh, chemo and, and novel hormone therapy shouldn't be combined in, in these patients. And also, I think that uh, we, have, we have discussed this before, it should be highlighted that ADT monotherapy, even though being common in clinical practice, is, is, cannot be considered standard of care anymore. It's suboptimal therapy, and this should be reinforced and highlighted for educational purposes that ADT monotherapy is a suboptimal treatment. So just to reiterate, strong evidence use ADT with another agent, whether it be androgen signaling inhibitor or chemotherapy, we don't go, this, these, and, and Nicola has, has really educated on that, these are guidelines. They don't tell you what to do. It's not like, you know, the absolute manual, you have to adapt it to your practice, but very strong recommendation against combinatorial strategies. And of course, uh, we have moved away from looking at high and low risk and volume for the use of either chemotherapy or androgen signal inhibitors. So, but with that in mind, Nicola and, 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 and Alvaro made a point, I don't really see a place for just ADT alone. If you were to say, I'm going to put in a little paragraph there, I'm going to show you where it is. Where do you actually make any kind, provide any guidance with who might be a candidate for only ADT? It's already in. It's already in the table. You have a line in the table claiming that if a patient is unwilling or unfit to receive any additional treatment on top of ADT, ADT monotherapy is the way to go. The question is, how often does it happen? Well, it's very, 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 very unusual, but the only way to say it. Alvaro, what do you think? Is it like a, a, a prognosis, comorbidities? If you have a heart failure, NIHA 3, somebody who is expected to have a survival of less than, I don't know, five years before because of his other underlying comorbidities, where would you draw the line? Uh, I think that this 
could be the answer when we only have chemo or Abby, because two different profiles, very different, but we have Abby, Ensa, APA. I mean, if a patient doesn't fit one of these agents because of previous comorbidities or expected toxicities, may fit in another. So I think that, as Nicola said, that patients only for ADT are a very, very small subgroup of patients. I mean, uh, it's, it's really, really strange. If a patient has a very serious disease, very, very serious COPD, ICC, I mean, heart failure, whatever, with a life expectancy of less than one year, for example, because of that uh, previous comorbidity, you may think of giving just ADT, but that's not so easy to predict. So I think that, uh, I think that should be reinforced that ADT alone is suboptimal and, and reserved for a very specific subgroup of patients, very, very small, very small group of patients. So, so just to put it in practical terms, I'm, I'm, let's say, looking at the guidelines and I have a 75-year-old with a couple of comorbidities, he's hypertension, he's, uh, he's, he's a little bit of obesity and uh, insulin resistance, what do you anticipate? He's got three meds, three meds based on conventional imaging. He comes in the door and I start a ADT and I'm debating which other agent to use. I would probably reach for an allergen signal inhibitor. Question to you, Nicola, do you think that it's absolutely okay to reach for, for let's say, Abby, APA, Enza, whichever of the three you want, uh, and you feel comfortable monitoring, and also add on down the line the radiation of the primary? Because we don't have data on there. Well, in this case, I would, ch I would check with my internist and with the cardiologist if yes or no, there's such a major risk to add something. Let me remind you with almost all of these drugs, the liver is the issue. The liver is an absolute issue. And it might be wise if he has only three meds, let's say he has only a low volume because he might have three meds and not such such a little volume, even if it was more than four, uh, it might be wise to, to give him radiotherapy to the prostate if it's feasible and it's possible. It Do we all agree? Safer. Is it more effective? Nobody knows because none of these treatments have been compared up front. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the interest of time though, Nicola, one more point from you. We're, we're getting closer and closer and you know how close my heart that is to challenging locally advanced disease that is just recently diagnosed as, whether it's locally advanced, clinical N1, or high risk. What is the different point that the guidelines are making? And guidelines, again, are for everyone out there to use, and I understand the caution in your statement. Well, there are two, I, I would say two quite simple messages, although one of them might be highly discussed. The first one is, how do we define CN1? All what is published so far, at least 99.9% .9 of what is published so far, is published based on bone scan, CT scan, and let's say MRI. MRI and CT scan, in terms of nodes, is absolutely equivalent, and the sensitivity is poor. We all agree on that. So in the guidelines, we, we just simply say nothing, very simple, about the new imaging modality that PSPSMA. We only use that for patients relapsing after local treatment. And we, it was mainly to avoid a very aggressive salvage local treatment where patients had already met. That's the first message. The second simple message is what is a node positive patient that CN1, CN1 equals nodes in the pelvis. I insist on that because very often patients are mixed of node positive meaning pelvis and retroperitoneum, which is completely different. It's an M1A, which has nothing to do with CN1. And the third message, if you're dealing with a CN1 patient, there's more and more and more and more evidence that the local treatment on top of the stenic one is needed. Which one? It's a matter of patient discussion. What risk do you agree? How do you feel with a radical prostatectomy if you're a surgeon? How do you feel with radiotherapy? If you're a radiotherapist, there's not a good and a bad option. There are two options, both of them having good points and poor points. The message is, if you go for surgery, it has to be very clearly said from the very beginning that it won't be surgery alone. It will be surgery plus something, and it might be surgery plus radiotherapy plus 
systemic treatment. That's the three main points regarding CN1. I, I find that, I, I'm very excited listening to this because I find it great progress. And of course, you know, you, you can see all these slides back here. It's my effort to try to kind of get to the point of where we're gonna have some markers to tell us where to go in this CN1 disease. And we're gonna probably hear more during this ASCO, but I think it's five or years away from having these predictors to decide, but we're getting there. So again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it a little forward to, to the big deal, let's call it. Uh, there's papers, there are papers coming out today. And, and as ASCO is starting, we're gonna also look at a lot of the poster discussions on all three trials that have been conducted in the non-metastatic CRPC, meeting their secondary endpoint, which was overall survival. We haven't looked at the data extensively, but, but the EAU guidelines, based on the primary endpoint, are giving a strong recommendation for use of androgen signaling inhibitors in this space of non-metastatic castration-resistant disease by conventional imaging criteria very, very clear. I think that, you know, it's going to be important to take in the new data, especially for people who have been reluctant to use these agents. So Alvaro and, and, and Heather, then I'd like your, your thoughts on, on how all of this is going to come together in the community. Well, I think that even though it's not the main aim point of the trials, it's, it's good to have the OS data because, as you perfectly said, some people may be reluctant to treat these patients because, I mean, they are, they are asymptomatic. It's only a PSA-driven treatment. So if we are not offering anything regarding survival and we are maybe adding toxicity because exposing these patients to, to these drugs, uh, as I said, without overall survival data, some, some people still may, may feel uncomfortable with giving these drugs. But today in ASCO, we have the data from these three trials with ensalutamide, capalutamide, darolutamide, and the three of them with uh, overall survival data with a remarkable benefit, statistically significant, although it's a secondary endpoint, it's not the main endpoint of the trial, but I think that this uh, cleans the way to a wider acceptance of this strategy because we have an impact in metastasis-free survival, which is remarkable, benefit in overall survival. The quality of life data show that adding a treatment is not detrimental. We are not uh, uh, we are not lowering the quality of life of these patients because of, of treating them so early in their disease when they are still asymptomatic. So I think that the, the acceptance of these treatments will, will become higher and higher with times. So the, 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 my main concern as a biased medical oncologist is what we will do afterwards. After a early and high exposure to hormone therapy, will we treat patients with chemo at the first metastasis? We, I don't know. I still don't know. I mean, uh, we will have to see. But uh, what is clear is that these drugs in this situation uh, have a clear benefit. And we will still have to learn which drug and when to use it and which patients uh, have the greatest benefit of, of, this, of, this, of these drugs, of these treatments. Heather, your, your thought, I, I know you're, that the, the quality of life and long-term exposure to these agents is very close to your heart and actually AU guidelines are making a point as we said on that if you were to take it all in how much of of responsibility will you now place on the end of the practice to to take care of these men long term um, well I think it's it's going to be a big commitment to take care of these men and to maintain their quality of life um, I've always liked secondary endpoints and I love this one um, you know this, and having three studies coming out at the same meeting, all showing the same overall or a, a overall survival benefit, I think really validates early versus later treatment. And personally, I think this is going to be a game changer for the management of non-metastatic CRPC. Are you concerned, like Alvaro, about uh, the aftermath when the disease progresses? I mean, it's a fairly evidence-free zone, isn't it, what we do then for CRPC. Um, and I guess that's something we're going to be feeling our way with. And chemotherapy is probably likely to be the, the next line of therapy for many of these men. Um, as 
the data for using abiraterone and enzalutamide sequentially hasn't really been very strong. And I think it will be interesting to know from the Spartan study that there appeared to be some response to abiraterone after abiraterone. And I think that will be something quite interesting to explore. I think you're being very politically correct. I would say the data is very, very weak. It's like, but but uh, having said that, I, I will I will take it back to Nikolai to kind of, of of give us a summary of how I may be wrong, but Nikolai I feel that the culture of the EAU guidelines is changing, and it's becoming more bracing of a of a much needed progress in the practices, keeping of course a little bit the reins on things such as advanced imaging and overuse of the agents. And of course, that's where I'd like to get your views. These are still EAU guidelines. You guys have managed to get to the point of getting the, the highest approval rating across our field, but it's still for urologists. And what we were discussing, all of us before, is how much now is it going to be a balance between urology, medical oncology, clinical oncology? How do you think we're going to move forward, especially since we heard last week data come forth about the approval of PARP inhibitors, the use of now, um, you know, companion diagnostics to try to understand who harbors mutations. This is going to be a very quickly changing field in the coming years, thank hopefully and thankfully. I will be politically incorrect. Uh, it's not EAU guideline. It is EAU guidelines, but in fact, it's EAU, EANM, ESTRO, SIOG guidelines. That is, urologist, nuclear medicine specialist, radi radiotherapist, radiology, there's also um, geriatricians, pathologists, etc. There is no official link with, with the ESMO. However, we have two medical oncologists on board. Somebody knows them, Maria De Santis and Silke Glisson. They know a little bit about prostate, about geo oncology. So just a little bit. So yeah. it's, not Europe, it's not urology guidelines. It is a real multidisciplinary guidelines. And what happens there apply to everyone in, in charge of treating prostate cancer. The pity is at a different level, we couldn't reach a close collaboration with some of the other specialists, but that's not ours, our fault. It's far away from science. This is far away from science. I said I wouldn't be very politically correct. You're absolutely giving the right tone for, for the end of our discussion. And, and it's uh, unfortunately we need to stop now. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, we've all interacted with each other over the years. And uh, it's just beyond just a scientific interaction. We were just talking about patients of ours going from one to the other part of the world and, and transitioning and, and how grateful we are for each and everyone's care for these patients. And I think that in the interest of that, what you are doing with the EAU guidelines should go above and beyond and actually eventually include ESMO. So I'm going to be politically incorrect as, as well, because you've done it well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you all for, for joining in. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.